Today, we are joined by Dr. Jeff Katzden from Duke University, who will walk us through the evolving role of Expertil in perioperative pain management. And if you are a clinician balancing safety and outcomes and costs, this is Essential Viewing. Hi, I'm Jeff Gadsden, an anesthesiologist from Duke University in North Carolina. And today we're here to talk about Expirel and where it best fits into contemporary practice. Safety, efficacy, and cost, three pillars guiding evidence-based decisions. Let's examine how Expirel measures up. So whenever I consider a therapy in my practice, I think of it through three lenses. Number one, safety. Is it safe? Am I gonna hurt somebody or, or what, what is the safety profile? Number two, efficacy does it actually work and how does it bring value to my patients? And number three, cost. What is it gonna cost me to bring that value to my practice and to my patients? Multi-vesicular liposomes enable sustained pupicin release optimizing analgesia. Let's hear how. So Expirel is packaged as a multi-vesicular liposome, which means that it is encapsulated in this phospholipid and cholesterol matrix. And these, as it goes into the tissues, that matrix dissolves, releasing these little packets of bupivacaine over a predictable time course. Now, let's shift from the mechanism to implementation, whether it's infiltration, fascial plane blocks, or peripheral nerve blocks, the precision when using Expirel is important. Currently, Expirel is used in three different ways. The first is as a surgical infiltration technique, so that a surgeon can infiltrate the surgical area with that local anesthetic solution. The second is as a fascial plane block, where we use ultrasound and guidance to put the local anesthetic solution in that intermuscular fascial plane. And the third is as a nerve block, and we have three nerve blocks that are on label. The first is interscaling brachial plexus block for shoulder surgery. The second is the adductor canal block, typically used for knee surgeries. And the third is a popliteal sciatic block used for foot and ankle primarily. So one of the things we learned the hard way in our experience with liposomal pipifacane or Expirel was that it doesn't behave like a regular local anesthetic because of the liposomal encapsulation and it doesn't cross fascial boundaries. Unlike regular local anesthetics, which you can see in the figure here, the pipifacane will spread in across cell membranes and across fascial planes. Expirel doesn't, and it stays where you put it, which means you have to be very precise with your application of it. And when we look back to some of the early studies that were done with Expirel, and we reflect on some of those failures in those studies, we realized, oh, geez, I think that we were not being precise enough. We were treating this medication like we would treat regular local anesthetics, and, and that's why we saw some of those studies fail. When it comes to the specific nerve blocks, there have been three pivotal studies that led the FDA to approve Expirel for three specific nerve blocks. The first is for the interscalene brachial plexus block, the second is for the adductor canal block, and the third is for the popliteal sciatic nerve block. Expirel is no longer theoretical. It has very well defined indications that are FDA approved for several nerve blocks. Let's take a closer look. With the interscaling study, it was a comparison of liposomal bupivacaine or Expirel versus placebo. And what we found was that there was a 46% reduction in pain scores over the first 48 hours, as well as a 78% reduction in opioid consumption over that first 48 hours. More patients were opioid free at 24 and 48 hours, and the median time to first opioid rescue was 4.2 versus 0.6 hours. So what we saw here was a definite effect with that medication over a prolonged period of time compared to placebo. So for the popliteal sciatic nerve block study, it was a little bit different because we had an active comparator. It was Expirel plus bupivacaine versus bupivacaine. And what we found was there was a 44% difference in the area under the curve over 96 hours. And you can see on the graphical portion of this slide, that there was a big difference after 24 hours. The pain scores are roughly the same for the first 24, which is what you'd expect because one group got bupivacaine and one group got bupivacaine plus Expirel. But then things changed. And the group that got bupivacaine had a much different and worse experience than the group that got Expirel uh, through the next 72 hours. And then in terms of the opioid consumption, we found a 61% reduction in opioid use in the group that had Expirel compared to bupivacaine. And what was particularly interesting for me was that the percentage that were opioid free over that first four days was 
24% in the Axperil group versus 6% in the Bivivacaine group, meaning that the pain experience for those people was just that much better if you got the Axperil. And the evidence is expanding. There are several pivotal studies which are compelling narratives on Expert's efficacy in real-world surgical scenarios. The adductor canal block study was very similar to the popliteal block study in that there was an active comparator with bupivacaine versus Expert and bupivacaine. What we found was there was a 23% reduction in opioids between Expirel and Bupivacaine, as well as an overall significant reduction in area under the curve between the two groups. Now, if you look at the slide, the pain intensity curves look kind of similar, although they were significantly different. What you have to remember about knee surgery is the adductor canal block is only one of several blocks that would attack pain for, for, the, for the knee um, surgery itself. And so we don't expect to have the same complete block solution that we did with the popliteal block for foot and ankle surgery. That's one thing. But the other thing to take away from this graph is that despite having lower pain scores, in the Expirel group, numerically, they also had significantly fewer opioids, which means you had a very robust analgesic effect. Despite taking fewer opioids, they also felt better in the Expirel group, which means that it was a very significant effect. Toxicity is always top of mind, but here the pharmacological profile tells a story, low systemic absorption, high safety threshold. These are reassuring data for all of us anesthesiologists who do lots of regional anesthesia. So Expel works, but is it safe? Uh, one of the ways we think about this is, well, what would happen if I gave it intravascularly? And this data you see here was collected in dogs. And it, what we found was it took 15 times more milligrams of bupivacaine when it was encapsulated in Expirel before we began to see symptoms in these dogs intra-arterially in the carotid artery compared to plain bupivacaine and six times more bupivacaine when it was encapsulated in Expirel compared to plain bupivacaine when it was injected intravenously. So one of the things I thought about when I first started using Expirel was that's a lot of milligrams in a 20 mil vial. Am I going to cause a massive increase in my plasma levels when I give this? And we have data on that. And you can see here that the curves are very low and slow across the board, no matter whether you're giving it as an infiltration or a fascial plane block or a nerve block technique. The peak plasma level, the Cmax, is only ever really around 300 to 400 nanograms per mil. Well, what does that mean? For context, the lower limit of toxicity for bupivacaine is about 2,000 nanograms per mil, which means that it's very difficult to imagine reaching that limit when your Cmax is only ever 300 to 400 nanograms. So this data helped me sleep at night and understand that this is a very safe drug in terms of the potential for last. Now that red curve you see on the screen, that is for a catheter. And we've known for decades, this is how catheters behave. You will get an increase in your plasma levels until you turn the catheter off and then it goes down. So the other thing I wondered when I first started using Expirel is, does this preparation have an effect on the local toxic effect on nerves? Because we know that all local anesthetics are inherently neurotoxic. And those studies have been done as well. And you can see an example here. Investigators took mouse facial nerves, injured them, and then placed them in different baths of local anesthetic including Expirel and saline. And what you can see here is that the Expirel and saline groups are virtually identical and had the highest rate of recovery, whereas every other local anesthetic had a lower rate of full recovery compared to saline or Expirel. Great outcomes can't exist in a vacuum. Cost effectiveness and reimbursement drive the adoption. The No Pain Act has changed the landscape. Let's hear how. So the third lens to look through is cost. And of course, cost is a consideration wherever you work. And the good news is that the No Pain Act, which came into effect on January 1st, 2025, is now mandating that CMS reimburse health systems for the use of a number of non-opioid therapies for Medicare patients in the HOPD setting. So for several years now, we've been able to use Expirel at the ASC and get reimbursed for that. But in the hospital setting, when I treated an outpatient, 
the hospital would have to eat that cost. Well, that's no longer the case. We're now being reimbursed fully for Expirel when we use it for Medicare patients and a number of commercial insurers uh, in the HOBD setting. There's a J code available to this for this. So that means that uh, your pharmacy and health system will be able to easily capture that cost. And so what that means is if you were only treating Medicare patients, you would immediately see a 106% reduction because we're getting reimbursed at ASP plus 6%. In more of a real world setting on the second part of that graph, you see with a mix of commercial and Medicare patients, we would see about a 56% reduction in our cost for Expirel, meaning that we were able to make better choices about where to use this medication and therapy across the entire range of patients that we see. So in summary, looking through our three lenses, number one, safety. It's a very safe drug and it's been used in over 15 million patients. Number two, it works. It provides long lasting analgesia when you use a very precise technique and it's been shown to be better than bupivacaine in a number of lower limb block models. And third, cost. The No Pain Act has approved access to non-opioid therapies like Expirel by reducing the cost barrier for outpatient procedures. In summary, Expirel offers extended analgesia, favorable safety margins, and now economic feasibility. And if you're involved in perioperative care, it's time to evaluate whether Expirel fits in your protocol. I hope you like this episode, and if you do, make sure you subscribe to the channel and never miss the future ones. Until next time. I'm Jeff Gadsden. Thanks for watching.